the longest of times, the biggest argument against building a gaming PC over, say, a console is that gaming PCs are expensive. And although this can be true, I have seen and built myself many computers at many different price ranges. What may be inexpensive to me will be very expensive to someone else, so it's good to raise the question that everyone can understand. How much does it cost to build a gaming PC capable of taking advantage of 1080p 144Hz? The way I see it, you can approach this in one of four ways. The first and simplest way is to buy everything brand new. The newest stuff will always be the easiest to use and more often than not, will hold its value for longer. But this simple option is not the Sam, I'm trying to record! But this simple option is not the best option for a number of reasons. Reasons of which I'll explain in a minute. The second way is buying used. Used components cost less and therefore you can buy higher performing components for the same amount of money. If you want to build a PC that will perform its best at a certain strict budget, this is usually the best option. The third way is a mixture of the two previous options. This is the option I actually went for in the gaming PC I built for today's video. This method entails shopping around smartly, buying new on the components that are vital to a long lasting computer and buying used on components that aren't. Let's start with the CPU, motherboard and RAM. I managed to find a used i7-3770, 8GB of DDR3 RAM and an LGA-1155 motherboard bundle all for £150. What's more, with this motherboard I was actually able to overclock that non-KI7 to get that little bit of extra performance for games and YouTube rendering. Not bad at all. So, buying brand new stuff for DDR3, we could only manage an Intel Pentium G3258 8GB of HyperX DDR3 RAM and, actually going £30 over our previous £150 price, a Micro ATX ASUS motherboard. If you were to buy on the new CPU platforms that support DDR4, 8GB of RAM would already take up £73 due to the ridiculous price of RAM at the moment, leaving only £77 for both the CPU and motherboard. There is physically nothing in the Ryzen 3 or Intel range that will fit in that price point. The cheapest you can go is a Ryzen 3 1200 and A320 motherboard for a total of £216 if you want to go AMD, or the Pentium G4400 and H110 M80X motherboard £464. However, this pales in comparison to the Ryzen 3 1200 CPU for gaming and work tasks, purely because the Ryzen CPU has more cores and also supports overclocking. So, to buy new there, you'll be spending a lot more money while getting much lower performance. This is an example where spending your money smartly will bring you a great return in gaming performance, stability and longevity. If a CPU and motherboard has been functioning for quite a while, chances are it won't break when you get it. These components can go on for years and years without any problems. RAM is a bit more risky because if there are any errors, it can cause instability and you could lose data. But those issues are always more obvious and you can always return for a refund if those issues are indeed present. Another component that's fine to buy used is the GPU. If a card has been used for mining, it might be best to steer clear of, but any used GPU that has seen your average gamer's use will be fine. For my build, I bought a GTX 1060, brand new, not used. I should have bought a used GPU here, but the reason why I didn't was because I was actually building this PC for a friend, and that was a component he personally selected as it came with a free game and was on sale. I didn't blame him, but I spent £160 on that card. 40 to 50 pounds more and I could have got a GTX 980 Ti, which is more GTX 1070 performance. Or if we're talking budget, then a GTX 970, which is 120 pounds and still matches the 1060. At the time of building this, AMD prices were still through the roof due to mining, so bear that in mind. Case and power supply, I can always recommend you buy new. Or if you are buying used, buy one from a reputable company. I bought a used 650 watt Corsair power supply which was semi-modular and 80 plus gold certified for just £35. I thought this was a great deal but when I received it, it didn't have any PCIe 6 pin or 8 pin power connectors, only Molex to PCIe power. I contacted the guy and asked if he still had them and he said he didn't and had lost them. I did my testing with the power adapters but it caused a lot of issues for the GPU performance wise. The power I was receiving just wasn't good enough to drive it. It would work, just not very well. The power supply was still under warranty, so I asked Corsair to replace the cable, and instead they sent me a whole brand new power supply, which I thought was very kind of them. Props to Corsair for that. The power supply they sent me actually had fully black sleeved cables, not sleeved ketchup and mustard. It also had all the cables I needed, which was fantastic news for me. The GPU was now getting appropriate power, and didn't have any more issues after that. But I had done the majority of my testing before I replaced this PSU. So please, if you're going to buy a used PSU, make sure it's still got warranty. I'll also test it first if at all possible, and make sure it comes with all the appropriate cables. I can also recommend you buy the case new, purely for the fact that it will look nice to have a new case, but this is purely aesthetical. 
and if you really want to look for the best bang for buck available, going used is totally fine on an old case. Many places will let you pick up cases for free, just ask around on Gumtree, Facebook and Hardware Swap or eBay. But I still haven't explained the fourth way of tackling a build. This might be the easiest and, in some cases, cheapest way too. You'll probably hear a lot of flack directed towards the people that buy computers for gaming pre-built instead of building it themselves. And so it seems, us PC builders can find a use for pre-builds also. What I can recommend to you is go and search i5 or i7 PC into the Facebook Marketplace. You'll find a few office or old pre-built PCs with no or a weak GPU, but everything besides that should be fairly good. For example, I found this GTX 970 i5 rig for just £350. This includes 8GB of RAM and an SSD. This will match the rig I built in this video for gaming, so you can really get some good deals out there through this. I built this PC before Christmas, but if I'd have waited until now to build this PC, this probably would have been the route I'd have taken. When I make these kinds of videos, I always get that one guy in the comments who thinks he's totally original by making the argument that a certain build won't be able to get 144 FPS at max settings in every game constantly without dropping. Of course, frame rate always depends on the game, how well it's optimised and the settings you're running at. What we're looking at in this video is the frame rate we're able to achieve specifically, not both graphics and frame rate as a general concept. You must also take into account there will be games that just aren't optimised or take a lot of horsepower to run. This is the same on any rig of any level of hardware. I have a 1080 Ti and an i7-8700K and even at 1080p there are some games that dip below 100fps. Unfortunately, only time and not money will fix these experiences, even if you opt for SLI. We must also take into account that any frame rate above 60 is classified as taking advantage of that high 144Hz refresh rate. In order to take advantage of it to a point where it was worth getting a 144Hz monitor in the first place, I feel anything above 70fps is definitely a discernible improvement over your bog standard 60 frames per second display. But for general 144Hz gaming, in popular games, this is what we'll be aiming for, around a mixture of high to ultra settings at 80 plus FPS, allowing occasional dips into the danger zone. The danger zone being anything below 70 FPS. I've been talking for a while and still haven't disclosed the full spec list of this new PC I built. In its entirety, it costs £440, and this is a build with a mixture of new and used components. It has an i7-3770, 8GB of RAM, an overclocking motherboard, a GTX 1060, and a 120GB SSD to boot, a 1TB hard drive for games, a semi-modular, 650W gold rated power supply, and the brand new NZXT S340 purple and white edition. A definite bargain for someone just starting out. If you're buying pre-built, you'd probably be spending around £600 for a PC with similar specs and likely a far weaker CPU. Right, so how does our PC perform? Well, as you know, the Molex adapter stopped the GPU from performing to its appropriate potential, but I got that sorted out and actually overclocked our GPU by 150MHz and our non-KI7 to 3.96GHz, then jumped into benchmarking. For Battlefield 1, completely maxed out at DX11 setting, at 1080p we saw an average of 81 FPS. It was very playable and very enjoyable. The game even saw frame rates in the 90s in certain maps, and when flying, capped off at around 95 to 110 FPS. It did, however, drop below 70 FPS in certain moments when you blew up a building with dynamite, or a barrage from the Dreadnought came and annihilated you and the surrounding terrain. Even so, these moments are very brief, only last a second or two, and so in Battlefield 1, you can safely say that buying a 144Hz monitor is worth it with this rig. If you like, lowering the settings to low and keeping textures on ultra saw the game keep above 100 FPS at all times. It may have looked a bit bleak, but if you want that 144 FPS cap, or as close to it as possible, it's definitely plausible with this PC. GTA 5 is a similar story. Luckily, GTA 5 is scalable, so on a mixture of high to ultra settings at 1080p, the game saw a lovely smooth 96 FPS on average. Shadows were soft, grass was on high, and anti-aliasing was dropped a notch to just FXAA. Take note, the advanced options were also off. This enabled us to have a blast with some mods and a few multiplayer matches too, at some very silky frame rates. PUBG seems to be a monster, few can tame, but this PC gave it its all. On the lowest settings, the game ran superb, reaching 121 FPS on average, with drops to the upper 100s when running through a red zone. I know there's a lot of people who play it at lowest settings, hence why I'm including it. Unfortunately, maxing out the game does take its toll, and this PC was only able to stomach a 64 FPS frame rate on average. This wasn't without its dips though, we would see it dip to upper 40s, mid 50s if looking at lots of explosions, or running around in the starting area. 
A mixture of low to ultra settings, with textures, effects, and anti aliasing on ultra and the rest on low, the game managed to keep a 78 FPS average. The main killer of FPS seems to be foliage and shadows. Textures slow you down if you have it installed on a hard drive, but not so much on an SSD, so I definitely recommend you run the game on an SSD to avoid missing or potato like textures. Although PUBG is definitely playable and you can take advantage of the high refresh rate, it won't be as worth it compared to the previous titles we've tried. Assassin's Creed Origins is up next, and 1080p completely maxed out, we got an average of 61 FPS. I was actually surprised by this figure. I genuinely was. I know this doesn't take advantage of the high refresh rate, but what's good about the new AC game is that the port is pretty decent and the settings in the game make it nice and scalable performance wise. With a mixture of settings, keeping shadows on high, textures, clouds and tessellation max, and model quality on medium with clutter, fog and the rest on lowest, we were able to get a beautifully smooth 75 FPS on average. Exactly our cutoff for what we deem worth it in the scope of our 144Hz monitor purchase. The game runs great on this system and I can definitely recommend you check it out, especially at higher frame rates. With everything maxed, things do drop below 60, so it's definitely worth it running on those mixed settings to get the best experience possible, compromising image quality with performance. I know it's a bit different, but finally H1Z1 was benched, and completely maxed out we got an average of 86 FPS. I ran out of time to benchmark the lowest settings on that game, but just running around and getting killed a few times, I could certainly feel that the high refresh rate was doing its job, making my movements and actions feel nice and snappy. So to answer the question of the video, how much does it cost to run games at 1080p 144fps, or more accurately, build a computer capable of high refresh rate gaming? Well, for me, the price was £440. If you shop around, you can get the experience for the price of £350. Hell, there are these office computers with 4th Gen i5s you can pick up for £80 brand new down at your local computer fair or on eBay. The only thing you need to do then is add an SSD for £30 and a GTX 970 for £120 and you've got a 144Hz capable PC for just £230. Nearly half the price I paid to build mine. Mind you, you do need to be aware of the wattage on the PSU. Make sure you get one that can power whatever you put into it. So, is PC gaming cheap? Damn right it is. I hope this video serves as proof for that fact. I have built a very capable PC for very little money, and you could go cheaper still. 144Hz gaming is an option open to a lot of gamers these days, and all it takes is for them to be willing to take that step over. The only thing stopping them is what they deem a big enough performance upgrade over regular 60fps for the purchase to be worth it. I have very sensitive eyes, so I can notice frame rates as soon as they go over 60. I can also tell the difference between 120 and 144. Not everyone can. I suppose the only real way to know for sure is to just take the plunge and hope for the best. After all, future upgrades can always make up for anything you're not happy with. But anyway guys, I do hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, then do show your appreciation by tapping that like button. I love your face and I will see you guys in the next one. Terra.